our man Marcus Hayes had a pretty good column, not only with Philly's topics, but that maybe the general manager is changing his tune a little bit. Marcus joins us now live on the show to talk about that and other Philly sports topics. Hey, Marcus, how you doing on this Labor Day? Hi, Ryan. How you doing, Pete? We're doing pretty well, buddy. And uh, I know that your column was headlined, if I'm not mistaken, Phil's GM, Matt Klentek, right? Suddenly a realist mm-hmm. is excited about next season. And that, like my favorite thing is in the headline because I rely on the ellipse too much. But those three dots basically <laughs> are the pause of like, wait a minute, dude. Why are you already turning the flag? Why are you turning the page? Well, because he's got some common sense. I mean, for me, this was never a playoff team. It was, you know, a bubble wild card team if everybody stayed healthy. The back end of the rotation wasn't that strong. Bryce Harper's a nice addition, but, you know, he's a he's a pretty good player. He's not an MVP candidate. Uh, you know, they, they're a pretty good team, and pretty good teams generally don't make the playoffs. And, you know, it's great to sell tickets and Bryce Harper jerseys and, you know, Philly Fanatic eyeball headbands. But the reality is they were never – good enough to win 95, 98 games, and anybody who thought that was being unrealistic, and, you know, if if Matt Klintak thought that, and I think he did at some point, that that, that to me was just unrealistic. You had three 500 or sub-500 pitchers after your number one and number two starters, and your number two starter maybe a game or two above 500 going into the season in Jake Arrieta. I mean, that do the math, you know? Yeah, Marcus, and happy birthday, by the way. This is Ryan. I know you're not. your birthday isn't today, but it was over the weekend, so just oh, wanted to sorry, that. throw that out there. Yeah, I wanted the brownie points, oh, not you. you. <laughs> but, um, you know, Marcus, this is – I love that you wrote this, and, I, you know, I, I texted PT, and I said we got to get you on to, to discuss this because you said, listen, he's, he has some common sense, and that's fine, but that hasn't always been the case, and maybe he's just learning how to – you know, be better with the media, but in the off season, they had that all in mentality that they're going to spend stupid money and that they're going to try and compete for this year and years to come. But now it seems like he, when he's finally in a corner, he's saying, well, 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 maybe it's not this year, but down the road. Like, I, I don't know if yeah. I love how he's been, I guess, portraying his plan. It's just when he goes back on his word from the, from last year, it seems like he doesn't have it together he doesn't have a plan outlined well i mean the, part of the plan was they believed that they needed to get better and they could address their defense which has gotten better their offense which is moderately better i guess you know here and there but also their bullpen which they addressed quite a bit and seven of their eight bullpen pieces on opening day are now done for the year you know they're, they're, his his contention is you can't have that much injury in one it, it concentrated at one position and expect to be as successful as you hope to be. Nobody has that much depth. I agree. I, I believe that had their bullpen been better, they probably would be four or five games better right now, which gives them a second wild card spot. But I never thought they were better than the Braves. I really didn't think they were better than the Nationals. I'm surprised the Mets are as good as they are. But, you know... <laughs> I can't fault a, a general manager who has made some decent moves during the season, who acquired Jay Bruce, who acquired Corey Dickerson, who acquired Smiley and Vargas, you know, for, you know, whatever, for, for nothing essentially. But to, to keep them relevant, to keep them competitive, in what I consider to be a kind of a garbage uh, league, the National League isn't very good right now. But, you know, he's done what he could do. Now, the argument could be. Even though the, the back end of the rotation didn't pan out, which was a miscalculation, maybe you shouldn't have signed so many older or acquired or retained so many older relievers because all three of the old older ace relievers, you know, guys you thought were going to get, you know, 50, 60, 70 appearances, uh, Robertson, Hunter, and Neshek are injured. And they're old. The old guys get hurt. You know, those are two pretty, pretty stark miscalculations and maybe a little bit of bad luck. But I can't fault a guy for saying, hey, you know, our, our plan was this injury tore apart our plan. And now we're, you know, we're happy to be in a position where we can be optimistic about not only September, which, you know, they're not giving anything up. They're not, you know, 
platooning guys all of a sudden or resting guys. We're, we're optimistic about September, but also we're optimistic about 2020 and 2021. If you have to predict or if you have to say, all right, I'm most confident that Klintak is going to do blank in the offseason, what is the move that we can confidently expect the, the Phillies general manager to make once the season ends? Is it starting pitching? Is it bullpen? Is it, you know, another position player? Or is it maybe none of the above? It'll, it'll be the bullpen again. I mean, they don't have any choice. They, their bullpen is in tatters. They have, you know, the, all three guys that they counted on this season. They can't count on next next season. You know, all three of them are sort of off the off the radar. Um, I expect them to make a, a strong run for a short term deal for a starting an older starting pitcher, and I expect them to make a, a strong run at a couple of middle relievers. You know, from my perspective, I see I see Jake I, I see Nick Pavetta and I see Vince Velasquez as, as bullpen pieces and always have. Maybe less Pavetta in the in the deeper pass than you know after he was demoted the first time this season. But after he was demoted, I saw him as a bullpen piece, and I've always seen Velasquez as a bullpen bullpen piece. I think they have bullpen answers in their system. I think they have bullpen answers on their roster. But whether they see that or not, uh, you know, I I don't think they see those guys as the as those kinds of pieces. But we'll see where they are this time next year. Ownership, front office. And Gabe Kapler, manager. Out of those three, what are you, you know, most pleased with this season, and maybe most disappointed or frustrated with? Well, again, I mean, I'm not frustrated or disappointed with anything because, well, for one thing, I'm not a fan. But for another thing, um, I didn't expect this team to be all that good. You know, they just didn't have back end rotation strength. And they had a lot of question marks in their bullpen, even though they, th- they they claim to have addressed their bullpen. I mean, they didn't have a closer going into the year. Teams that don't have a closer going into the year seldom do well. They just don't. When, when that part of the bullpen, if you don't have a number one and a closer on your roster, then you have a lot of questions to answer. There's a lot of ambiguity, and that affects how, that, that affects how the whole team plays. When you don't have an ace and a closer, they didn't have a closer. So, you know, my disappointment is nil. I expected them to be better than 500. I, I got to tell you, I think uh, Gabe Kapler has done a pretty good job as far as managing wins out of a team that has every reason to be four or five games below 500. You know, I mean, it's it's been kind of remarkable that they've stayed relevant. I don't know if he deserves a lot of credit, but he'll get all the blame. So I, I think we should credit him with keeping them relevant too, you know? Yeah, so, you know, if, if your expectations, Marcus, Marcus Hayes joining us uh, here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, if your expectations for this team weren't that high, you know, is this season, you know, I'm doing the typical sports radio, you know, pick a pick a side. Do you grade this season a success? Do you deem it, I know you're not going to deem it a failure, but, you know, how do you, how do you recap this season? It's not over yet, but if you had, you know, no, expectations it's, it's that fell in line with this, yeah. No, this is a failure in that, uh, for them, this is a failure. This isn't a failure as far as what I expected, but it's a failure of their plan. You know, all four back-end rotation pitchers, Eflin, Eikhoff, Pavetta, and Velasquez, proved to me that they aren't anywhere near ready to be, you know, 30 start-a-year pitchers. That's a huge failure. You know, counting on this many old relievers, all of whom get hurt, that's a huge failure. You know, GMs in every in every sport in every in every city take gambles every year, and their their gambles fell through. You know, I expected them. It doesn't sound like much, but 88 wins versus 85 wins is a big deal. 88 wins versus 83 wins is a huge deal. So I expected them to be in about an 88, 89 win team. I'm not disappointed, but you know, the the general manager constructing the team in this manner was. It just wasn't a very – if you are serious about winning a pennant and Dallas Keuchel, if you look at Dallas Keuchel's numbers, left-handed starter who won at $120 million over, you know, five or six years going into the uh, – going into spring training and then wound up uh, settling for $13 million for the rest of the year, I want to say like in mid-July. If you look at his numbers after his first two starts, he, he puts the Phillies in the wild card – not only in the wild card race, but probably tied for the second spot. That was a mis- that was a miscalculation. So it's been a failure for uh, Matt Klentak 
and Andy McPhail if Andy McPhail is signing off on this stuff. But I wouldn't call it a, a failure for Gabe Kapler, and that's just not it's not fair the way that Gabe Kapler is perceived. But again, he makes his own bed with the way he presents himself and talks, and you know the, the words that he uses. People aren't comfortable with, but he's done a decent job given the, the cards he's been dealt. All right, so you know, despite your your assessment of Kapler and even Klentak and the rest of the crew, for the listeners out there, I have to ask you this: Do you believe anyone's job is in jeopardy? And if it's not in jeopardy this off season, when is it fair to say it could be? Whether it's Middleton, I mean, I know you know that's ownership, but is is an ownership change coming if nothing gets better? Is a GM change coming if nothing gets better, or is a, a change with Kapler coming? What what could be the first domino if improvement isn't on the horizon? Yeah, I'm not sure about the ownership question. That that, that can't change. So um, unless he sells the team, and he's not going to do that. So no. Yeah. Um, McPhail just signed an extension last year, and and Quintex signed an extension this year. Kapler enters 2020 as a lame duck, and not only do you sort of he can't do that, so you kind of either have to let him go or you have to extend him. And it, selling Philadelphia, selling John Middleton on selling Philadelphia on an extension of probably the least popular manager in the last 50 years is going to be a really, really tough sell. And it has nothing to do with fairness, because as I said, I think Kapler managed very well last year and very well this year, considering what he was given. And, you know, he could have presented himself in his cases more palatably, but he's not, He's. Not, I mean, I don't agree with the way he used Michael Frankel this year. I don't agree with the way he used Scott Kingery the last two seasons. And he's had some issues with, you know, pitcher usage and things like that. But that's the the last part is true of every manager in, in every city. Nobody manages per, manages their their bullpen and their starters perfectly. It's amplified because of who Kapler is and where Kapler is. That said, you know I don't see how he can go into next season as a lame duck manager with any sort of leverage, especially on a team full of veterans when things start to get you know get uh get ugly. And it would be a popular move to fire Gabe Kapler. And we've seen that John Middleton does popular things. The only person in, in peril is Gabe Kapler, and I think that peril is real. Marcus Hayes with us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Covers the Phillies, covers the Eagles as well. And Marcus, you had a column up recently about the offensive line. And, uh, you know, once again, if there are question marks, because, look, there's a lot of people projecting the Eagles to be in the Super Bowl. There's a lot of people that say that this is as talented and as deep an Eagles roster as they've ever had. Thankfully, nobody's pulled the Vince Young move and uttered some stupid comment, and then uh, we in the media got to all run with it. That hasn't happened yet. But but you write about the O-line uh, probably being maybe the cause of the most angst or agenda. And uh, tell us about that. Well, uh, Brandon Brooks hasn't played a snap. He's uh, the right guard, the all-pro uh, Pro Bowl right guard. And he hasn't played a snap in the preseason because he blew out his Achilles at the end of last season. Lane Johnson's been sidelined for a month. He hasn't played in a preseason game since the first one has been limited in uh, practice. Jason Peters is an occasional practicer. He played in a couple of games. I mean, the biggest issue for the first half of 2018 was that the offensive line wasn't playing as well as it should have or as well as it could have, uh, as well as it was expected to, given his pedigree, I see that happening again. You know, the offensive line is, Doug Peterson said last week that the offensive line is the unit that probably needs reps together in game time situations more than any other because they have to work in such intricate concert and such tight, in such uh, tightly confined spaces. That said, this unit has not been able to do that. So <laughs> I don't understand, uh, you know, it's going to be an interesting it's going to be a, a, a tough task against uh, Washington on Sunday, you know, with uh, if Brandon Brooks starts, which it sounds like he's going to, and if he doesn't, Halapulavati Gaitai, you know, starting in his stead at, at the first time he's ever started at guard, I believe, at any level. So there are lots of issues that need to be, I guess, quelled. And, you know, this time, you know, this time on Sunday, we might be saying, hey, th those worries were unfounded because this, this line played together last year. They're, they're, they don't need the practice to, to you know, get that cohesion. But I don't think so. I think it's going to be two or three weeks before we see this offensive line do what it's capable of doing. And I think it's capable of being not only the best offensive line in the league, but the best offensive line 
Philadelphia's ever seen. Wow, that's a strong statement. You, you, you know, their pedigree is good, and you, and you write that the five projected starters have combined for 15 Pro Bowls, five All-Pro selections. They're going to make about $40 million, so it's not like they're scrimping money or they're trying to go cheap or trying to put a Band-Aid there. You know, I, I do want to ask you about Steph Wisniewski. He was one of the cuts, and, you know, in the entire time of his Eagles career, Wiz, to me, was like the guy that never got the fair shake. He did what he was asked to do, but they never seemed to, like Jeff Stoutland or the Eagles as a whole, never seemed to want to, you know, well, if we have to, we'll turn to him until ultimately now they feel like they can do it without him. Well, he's a small guy who's not particularly strong or athletic, but he's very, very smart. He can do everything for you, including play center. But if you have guys, if, if you are running a team, and you have younger, bigger, stronger, faster players who you believe you can develop over the next four to eight weeks to be as good or as, as effective or more effective than Steph Wisniewski as a backup, then that's an easy call because we know what Wisniewski's ceiling is. We don't know what their ceiling is. And if anything, this team is way behind the, the curve in developing young offensive linemen who can step in after a year or two of uh, of understudy duty, and they're, they're going to need that. You know, Jason Kelsey's probably out of here in a year or two. Brandon Brooks probably isn't going to get another contract. Um, you know, they're, they're getting old. You know, Jason Peters, this might be the last year he plays left tackle with uh, Andre Dillard being as talented as he is and Jason getting a little bit older. He might move to guard himself. So I understand the Wisniewski decision. I believe Wisniewski might be back here sooner than later because of just, you know, just because of the, the overall makeup of this team and the fact that, you know, he's a plug-and-play guy. He may not play, you know, above average, but, you know, sometimes average is a godsend in week five, you know. No doubt. Uh, did you chuckle then? I mean, you mentioned Andre Dillard there. You know, when people heard that Jadavian Clowney was available initially, there were people on social media that were like, sure, trade Andre Dillard to get Jadavian Clowney. And, of course, I'm thinking, like, you know, what are you, nuts? <laughs> well, my my contention was uh, it was by, uh, if Brooke was going to be healthy, then having Hal Pulavati Vitae on the team is a luxury if you could trade him for Jadavian Clowney and maybe a pick. Um, he's a he's a you know he's a four position player at this point. He's a guard tackle in his what I believe fourth year in the NFL. You know he's uh, and he's I think he's under contract through next year because he signed an extension. So I thought he'd be a, a, a good fit. Maybe they're just not willing to give up Baitai for you know a, a one year rental of a guy that they probably would not extend past this coming season. I, I think he's a, a fine finishing piece, but you don't give up a first-round pick for Jadavian Clowney at this point, you know, unless Jadavian Clowney has already agreed to a deal, which you can't do now because of that deadline has passed, unless he's already, already agreed to a deal and you know what you're getting down long-term and can adjust your salary cap and your salary structure accordingly. You also wrote about uh, Andrew Luck's retirement, and I don't know if we've spoken to you since that took place, but Ryan and I both, you know, as is the modern 2019 version of how things happen, somebody runs up to you and says, what do you think? And then you check your phone. And somebody somebody said to me in the same sentence, what do you think about Luck? I said, uh, well, why, what happened? You know, and then the guy tells me, and then he says, is it true? So I got my phone out and looked at Twitter, and it was the top three trending topics. So I thought, well, yeah, but it's probably true if it's blasting up Twitter on a Saturday night. Uh, uh, you wrote that some of the Eagles weren't surprised that Andrew Luck retired. What was your stance on that? Because, I mean, wow, if, if Philly fans, would they have booed Wentz? If it, you know, that, yes. was, that was Ryan's question. Would they have booed Wentz if it came out that way at Lincoln Financial Field? I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's not apples to apples. There's been a lot of disappointment around Andrew Luck during his tenure in Indianapolis. He, you know, he wasn't the second coming of Peyton Manning. He's he's a very very talented guy who stays hurt. And regardless, I mean, from my perspective, I think a guy who plays with you know internal bleeding and all sorts of structural issues deserves nothing but praise. And you know, he's a he's a Wall of Fame Hall of Fame guy. For that city but you know i understand that most people are i shouldn't say most people some people are you know idiots and they do idiotic things like who a guy who literally could ne could not have done more for you he did everything he possibly could to make your team better 
make your team better and to, you know, at risk of his own well-being. So I don't think Carson Wentz is seen that way here. I think Carson Wentz is uh, more appreciated having done less than Andrew Luck at this point. I mean, if Carson Wentz has a back issue this year that is deemed chronic, which is not out of the realm of possibility. There were reports that he had a back issue in high school, and last year he had a you know a fractured vertebrae in his back. And so, say it becomes chronic, and you know all of a sudden he's told by doctors that you're risking your long-term health. I don't think Carson Wentz gets booed off the field next preseason. I, I really don't. I, I mean, and nobody's more critical of Philadelphia fans than I am. From you know the, what what happened at the Donovan McNabb draft to Michael Irvin on the on the turf with a uh, a neck injury, people cheering the ambulance. Nobody has been more critical of Philadelphia fans in the last 25 years than I. But you know, and so I think I have a pretty good finger on the pulse of who and what they are. You know, Carson Wentz is seen as a guy who, you know, he's pretty beloved and with good reason. I, I think there's a real connection here. I, I would be surprised if he was good. Marcus, you've been doing this for a long time, and and you get your your you know news and info in a variety of ways. But in the world we live in today, Instagram likes and and who you start following, I guess, is now a uh, a telling sign of of what's to come. Allegedly, <laughs> Melvin Gordon uh, is is active on Instagram with current Eagles players, and it, 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 does that mean now for you that Melvin Gordon's going to be an Eagle? Obviously, because he added three eagles on instagram <laughs> um no i think melvin gordon's trolling a lot of cities he's added other teams and other players on his instagram account as well and uh you know i think he does that you know kind of for it's the kind of thing you do when you're desperately seeking attention you know what i'm saying it's uh yeah i don't have a i don't have a great sense of humor for guys who are uh, not honoring their contracts i, I just don't i mean the, the, the team the team is comprised a certain way with the expectation that you're going to play. And if there's an impasse, there's an impasse. You make them pay next year, not this year. I, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for guys who leave the other 52 guys out because that's what that's really what you're doing. I mean, you can you can argue that I'm, I got to look out for mine, but when you're you know when you're a, a premier player and you don't show up to work, and the team has been built around you to a degree then you're affecting the livelihoods of 52 other guys. And I, I'm not I'm not cool with that. Jeez, Marcus, it's like you put it on a tee there for me to ask you about Ezekiel Elliott then. I mean, because that's still trying to resolve itself. Uh, then what's your takeaway from that situation? And will it have an impact on the Cowboys overall? I mean, uh, it, it certainly will. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott's the best running back in the league. Um, it certainly will have an impact. But again, I have no sympathy for Ezekiel Elliott, who, you know, agreed to terms of a contract. And when people say, well, the contracts aren't guaranteed, nobody makes guys play football. Nobody says you have to be an NFL football player. The NFL football salary uh, bargaining agreement, the collective bargaining agreement, is public domain. You can read it. You can under you understand what the team has a right to do and what it doesn't have a right to do. When a team cuts a player, there is no penalty for cutting that player when a player holds out there's a penalty because these things have been collectively bargained so one is right one is wrong and there's no i understand the way the game is played quote unquote but one is right one is wrong and uh arguing any other any other don't get me wrong i was a cowboys fan when i was a kid but the organization they became under jerry jones i'm not really that fond of so I take a, a bit of pleasure in, in their misery at this point. But, you know, whether it's Ezekiel Elliott or, or whoever, you know, whether it's Pittsburgh, Dallas, or uh, Los Angeles Chargers, it, it's not right. Marcus Hayes is always right, especially when he joins us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN, even on a holiday Monday. Marcus, we sure appreciate you, appreciate your work. Follow him on Twitter at Wretch. And, of course, subscribe to the Inquirer. I know I do. That's how I get all the great content. Thanks a lot, Pete. I appreciate it. Talk to you later, Ryan.